Welcome, everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Nice to see you all. Wow. It's uh, really sweet here last week at the Dharma Collective. I feel like we generated quite a bit of, yeah, positive energy in here for folks who were here last Wednesday. We chanted. I know. And I think, as Tom said, we were almost on tune once. Um, but it was so nice to bring that kind of heart of deep care to our practice and bring our voices together and um, be in the awkwardness of that together. And also, you know, just that feeling of taking in those words of Omani Padme Hum. So that was really sweet. I, I think I'd like to do that again. I know folks will likely be out of town a bit on the 20th, but hoping we can do that again together on the 20th, kind of like a special holiday experience. And we had our, our half day here on Saturday and we, we went deep. We just went for it. Someone's like, yeah, did you walk or stretch? I was like, no, we just sat like a lot. Uh, it was very special to be together in that and, and inspiring of, um, yeah, mm, I'm going to keep it. I might get, I might get cool. A nice bike right here. Um, and this weekend we really, we went, you know, into pulling apart the very foundational aspects of practice together. And I think this book in general that we've been traveling together for now, I think it's 68 chapters. Um, it really always keeps circling back to the foundations over and over and over and it's interesting, the teachings, as I've mentioned, you know, the Buddha is really in the very end of his um, cycle of teaching and welcome. And he is threading together the same ideas over and over because the Dharma is always the same ideas over and over. But the teaching tonight, um, some folks may be familiar with, it's the kind of three gates of liberation very sweet, very succinct. And there's one quote that I wanted to kind of start us with. And it's that liberation and enlightenment don't exist outside of ourselves. We just need to open our eyes to see that we ourselves are the very essence of enlightenment and liberation. We are also, it doesn't say this, the essence of our suffering, right? And I think it's really beautiful to see over and over that in coming together to practice, we are cultivating the kind of calm mind, the possibility to calm mind and body together. And just like when you have really disturbed water, you can't see the bottom, like it's all, you know, mucky in there. But with that calmness and that stillness, insight comes in. And when those two are together, the calmness and the insight, we really can see like, yeah, of course I'm the essence of liberation. Like where else would it be? It's not out there. So it's just these really beautiful threading together of practices every time. And before I launch even further into a preamble, welcome to the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Friends here, friends online. Really nice to be together, whether it is your, you know, 100th night in a row or it's your first night here. This is a place that is really designed to hold community and give ourselves an opportunity to practice together. Um, and as I've mentioned many times, but it's always worth mentioning, each and every person showing up here is a huge generosity to one another. If we were just at home by ourselves reading this book, we might pay attention for a little while before we got distracted and then we'd come back and we get distracted and, you know, just having each other as accountability is huge. And what I've been emphasizing, especially the last couple of weeks, can we really start to see and know and feel one another as a community? And that doesn't have to mean you know each other's last names or what you do, but to really feel like, yeah, we are here for the same thing. We are here to kind of cultivate that calmness, forge the heart, 
and that that in and of itself can help us drop and deepen our ability to be in the body. Trying to sit down and meditate after our really busy day or right after our coffee, sometimes it can work. We can kind of like hit into a place where mind, heart, and body are in the same place, like following the breath. But to really feel like we are kind of physiologically, psychologically safe in community allows us to drop in even deeper. So before we get started in practice, um, yeah, I would love for folks to, you know, not in a kind of searchy, checking everybody out way, but just look around a little. We are all here together, folks online, we're, we see you too. Yeah, and just to get that sense of, yeah, being here together. Yeah, I get a really good view. I get to see all of you. So just trying to share some of that. And I thought tonight it would be nice to practice something we worked on this weekend. I sneak preview. I really do think we should do Tenzin Wangyal Rinpoche's book, True Source of Healing, next. It's a it's a short one. Um, we'll get through it not in a year, <laughs> but like, maybe even in two months. Um, but it it is just such beautiful pithy wisdom and some of you who know Rinpoche lives here in the East Bay and he's from the bond tradition so from the indigenous uh, tradition of animism Buddhism um, practice in Tibet and he really brings in a lot of elements a lot of the natural world into how he teaches that I, I find really supportive and he offers these three precious pills he calls them I don't think he knows the matrix reference he, he would totally find it hilarious if he did. Um, then he would just go for two pills. He'd try to find a way, I'm sure. But these three precious pills he talks about are stillness, silence, and openness. And what we did this weekend, and I'd like us to try together here, is to really layer on each of those to really feel like the benefit of finding stillness in the body and feeling that sense of stillness in the body. And when we have stillness in the body, we're not saying it isn't the mind, right? We're considering them together. Yet, some just stillness of physical form can actually help orient the mind to be a bit more still. And the silence is, you know, the silencing of the inner speech, but also the relative silence in that we chose to come here together to practice, not to be in ongoing dialogue and discussion. Of course, we'll do that later. But just, again, really feeling that quality of silence, even though there's a lot of inner dialogue. But it's this choice or this preference or orienting towards silence as opposed to orienting towards or kind of putting in the forefront of what matters to us, um, dialogue and uh, narration of what's happening. And then the spaciousness, uh, it's really, or openness as he calls it, he also says it's warmth. And it's an openness and warmth of the heart and the mind together. And in that, we're really using imagination. Like we can't actually feel the heart open, maybe a little bit, but really the sense of that there can be a real spaciousness and openness in the heart and the mind. So that's what we're going to start with. And then, yeah, we'll ease ourselves into a practice of kind of stabilizing in those qualities and seeing what we can kind of harvest from especially doing that together, doing that in um, in the context of being able to really feel the sense of responsibility and community um, that is gathered here tonight. So with that, please find a comfortable posture, a, co a posture that really is balancing the qualities of ease, relaxation, as well as vividness, uprightness.
And you are welcome to have your eyes slightly open or closed. Let's start with this process of finding more ease in the body by inhaling our shoulders up and feeling that scrunch up and then exhaling, release. And twice more, inhaling up, exhale. And one more time together. Feeling maybe a sense of relative openness in the chest. And taking a moment to really soften, really feel into what softening means through all the muscles in the face. We no longer at this moment, have to express anything or communicate or in any way use and arrange the muscles in the face so we can let them be completely at ease, like the face of a sleeping baby. And can we bring that same softening around the shoulders, and through the chest. So many of us are walking around with our shoulders almost at our ears all day long. We just continue to invite that ease, nothing right now to hold. The invitation to let the shoulders feel completely at ease. Finding the ease and gentleness through the belly. Taking a moment to really feel <clears throat> a sense of this place, the physical space where we're in, either here at the center together or at home. And the temperature, the sounds that are subtle around us. And also a sense of the greater space around us, the darkness of the night sky here in winter. Feeling a sense of the season. And as we hear the bell to formally begin the practice, see if we can allow the sound of the bell to fully hold our attention and awareness all the way to its very last note.
beginning by shifting our attention and awareness to this precious pill of stillness and inviting and feeling the quality of stillness in the body. Of course, there's movement. There's a gentle undulation of breath coming and going. Where we place our attention and awareness is in the relative stillness, the stillness amid the motion of the breath. And of course, the mind is busy. You may get carried away. But every time, with as much gentleness as possible, just returning and choosing stillness to rest the attention and awareness in whatever amount of stillness you can experience in the body. We may find or discover that the stillness is always already there, and yet we get carried away. But to choose stillness, such a powerful choice, moving against the momentum to do, to get, There might be some discomfort in trying to connect with stillness, no problem. There might be some difficulty in connecting with stillness, no problem. Just an invitation, a welcoming for the possibility of touching into stillness moment by moment.
We can't force stillness. Stillness naturally arises or emerges. And we make the space and keep returning over and over. And just find that we naturally settle. Attention and awareness, maybe feeling as they, though they descend in the body a bit. A little less in the head center, a little more in the belly center. And with the stillness, we may naturally find that the silence is already here. We intentionally shift our attention and awareness to connect with silence. And the invitation to silence is to at least not prioritize or even turn down the volume of our inner dialogue. And feel and imagine a sense of inner silence mingling with a sense of outer silence. We can't stop our thoughts, but we can redirect or prioritize resting our attention and awareness and a sense of silence, a choice of silence. While still very much rooted in this quality of stillness and silence, inviting now this third precious pill, openness. Feel and imagine a sense of openness, spaciousness, and warmth. Almost as though we were unencumbering the mind. Instead of only being in the clouds of our thoughts, we find ourselves so much more vast in the sky. Again, no need to force or push away thoughts, just redirecting and expanding the sphere of our attention and awareness.
As we invite openness and warmth, we may experience areas that feel heavy, constricted, no problem. Really feeling warmth all around those areas. No agenda, no forcing. Just bringing into our kind awareness and attention in these areas. We may notice our heartbreak, our worry. Again, no problem. Just including that within our attention and awareness. The sensations and pure experiencing of it, not the story. The warmth of this openness is the warmth of kindness. There's no way we're doing this wrong. There's no way we should be having a better experience. See if we can be kind every time we're opening. Notice what is the feeling of openness like throughout the entire body? Not just an openness of our imagined mind, but an openness throughout the body, heart, and mind. And inviting a sense of the interweaving of the stillness and the silence and the openness together. Even as thoughts and memories and images arise, just keeping returning, and rejoicing, relaxing back into these qualities. Part of this warmth that we can experience and the openness is the warmth of knowing that we are already good. This warmth of knowing that our Buddha nature is already here. Our natural intrinsic desire to be of service to others our natural intrinsic capacity for great kindness and compassion. And we can't force that feeling, but we might notice it starts to glimmer or shine through with the silence and the stillness and the openness. Is there any sense or presence of our basic goodness that's here right now?
Recognizing the goodness that is in us, unconditioned goodness, makes us realize the goodness in every being, naturally giving rise to that aspiration for our practice, that awakened heart, knowing that this is what we are here for. So finding whatever spark of bodhicitta is here, whatever desire to wake up for the sake of all beings, become a slightly more sane human, more kind, more caring. Just really feel the aliveness of that wish. Taking a moment and really noticing and attending to the body. Just feeling and experiencing the full presence of being within the body. Areas of sensation, movement, energy. And returning to the simplicity of over and over and over, returning and re-engaging with inviting silence, stillness, and openness. And if you ever wonder what you should be doing, see if you can find openness around that question. If ever a thought, memory, or image carries you away, just come back and re-engage with the silence. And if the body has an itch or ache, no problem, at returning to that stillness.
you may notice attention and awareness can become quite subtle. We may fall into dullness if we get caught up in feelings of drowsiness or fogginess. But if we can maintain attention and awareness, even through the stillness and the silence, we have a high saturation experience of even subtle sensations and subtle sounds. Checking back in, seeing if the face remains soft and gentle, the chest <clears throat> soft and gentle, the belly soft and gentle. While well, finding that sense of vividness and aliveness through the back of the body. Through the inhale, we could invite that quality of uprightness and vividness. And through the exhale, ease, relaxation, gentleness, softness. And for the last moments of our practice, regathering the attention and awareness. And taking a couple moments to hold ourselves in kindness. 
see if we can experience this invitation to really hold all of ourselves in kindness and care. And feel that sense of kindness and care throughout the body. Feeling this very body as a body of kindness and compassion and care. Thank you for your practice. So here at the Dharma Collective, an entirely volunteer run organization, I would say also really a community run organization as we engage in dialogue together, questions, answer, we really keep close to that core motivation of what we're here for, developing an ability more and more to be kind and caring, to have the least harm possible, right? And that includes in, in our, our body, speech, and mind. So what we're thinking maybe as others ask questions or share, what we ourselves are sharing in words, so really being mindful and having that practice of compassionate listening and compassionate sharing together so that we can do our best to have folks feel open and wanting to connect and reflect. As I have said many times, if I sat up here talking at you every night, get you like a little place uh, when you all are asking questions and hearing it from different voices and ideas and trying it on that's where the transformation really lies but to make that possible yeah we kind of got to constellate a community every time we come together so <clears throat> With that, for folks here, please use the mic so our friends at home can listen. And for folks online, raise a hand. Any questions, comments, reflections on the practice, on the three pills or otherwise, on the relative bliss or insanity of your mind? Yes, please. Uh, well, thank you. That was lovely. Another just, you know, opening warm uh, glow. Um, <clears throat> and the topic of community has been on my mind um, recently as, as well. Not only the communities that we sort of belong to, but sort of the communities that we weave in between mm -hmm. all of those different groups of people. And that then also led me to think a little bit about how um, some of the conversations, you know, that we've been having around um, the reading have really been sort of intertwined and uh, with other sort of uh, catalysts and inspirations that, that I've been going through in the last six months. Mm. And it's just so f fascinating to see that tapestry come mm. together is, you know, as I've been struggling with some of those themes and then they start coming up in, in this Dharma and it's like, <laughs> fuck, what's going on? you know, whoa. <laughs> and we'll bleep it out. Don't worry. Bleep, bleep. <laughs> and, and I just want to, you know, uh, say how much I appreciate mm -hmm. that odd sort of like, uh, 
you know, energetic, you know, dance mm. that, that I feel like I've been having, mm. um, along the, the course of, you know, this last, this last year. Mm. So, um, yeah, I've finally gotten up and said that. So thank mm. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Beautiful. Yeah. And I think you are pointing out to such a lovely aspect of these teachings, which is in any part of them is like the whole teaching at once. And, you know, I love this idea again of the, the night of the Buddha's awakening and he's looking at this one leaf and in the one leaf, he sees the presence of everything, right? He sees the sunlight, he sees the water, he sees, you know, all the seed that led to it and the seeds before that. And I think with the Dharma, like when we start like weaving and like seeing the story, they really are everywhere. It is, um, it's a little spooky. Like, are you reading my diary? Um, but also I think it's really encouraging, right? Again, if we believe in this story of the Buddha, what we believe in is someone who really dedicated themselves to watching the patterns of life and just seeing that cyclical nature, that interconnected nature. So how beautiful that it's alive in you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Other folks, questions, reflections. I taught for Vinny on Friday night and a woman said, I'd like to testify. And I was like, I'm so ready for that. <laughs> that was really awesome. So testifying. Um, yeah. Friends online, questions, reflections. God, my eyesight's getting worse every week. Okay, good. Remembering that not only is your presence a generosity, but your questions. I think a couple of weeks ago, we had one or two people just say how much they like of horror meditation, which I thought was very helpful reflection because their mind is crazy, right? And this belief that it should be different, right? That's in the way. Um, so yeah, any questions, reflections? Objections. What did what did people notice about the different quality of stillness, silence, openness? Did it feel different qualitatively? Could that could you recognize that in the body or heart or mind? Was one easier than another? Yes. Yeah, the word's always kind of hard to um, describe, but today, because I've been paying attention more to feelings or qualities, yeah. um, I realized that I went very deep mm. and it felt very good. Mm. And as soon as I realized that, I got distracted and drifted up. And I was like, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> and I came back. And so the, mm -hmm. the quality feels... Um, it feels like this profound uh, profoundness. Yeah. But then um, I sink into it and then I open, oh, I don't open my eyes, but then my mind steps in because you, I left and then I was just like then drifting into something and, yeah. and then I have to rinse and repeat. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, I appreciate your determination to rinse and repeat. Who can relate to that feeling of the, Yeah. And that, that profound, you know, or, or whatever you wanted to, you could call it again, like luminous, maybe it could be spaciousness, openness, bliss, right? Even, even the glimpse of that, it really is nourishing. I do think like it's a, a form of replenishment for us to experience that in our own body, heart, and mind. <clears throat> and then the falling away, it's so painful. It can be right. And that can be such a important place. Like it sounds as though you weren't getting caught up in the, I should, I should have, or I shouldn't have, or darn, why can't I stay? Just come back, just come back. Right. And what good training, because that happens for us in so many different ways throughout life. 
but it is really tough and the inner critic and the striving tonight in these three uh, gates of liberation the third one is aimlessnessness aimlessness 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 i don't want to add another ness um aimlessness and i don't know about you all the first time i heard that teaching i was like that sounds not productive <laughs> And that's the point, actually, the aimlessness. It is so counter. I think, you know, in the time of the Buddha, this was meaningful. So we haven't been the only uh, time in history where people have been busy and directed outward. But to re really give a priority to not striving, like to really make aimlessness a priority, something that will liberate us. Wow really hard really hard you know um yeah it's such an edge for many of us to to rest not fall asleep right but rest and that aimlessness is kind of a, a full body heart mind rest but it's again it's like the intention of it um and in our practice i really can feel that striving when I'm having a, a day where the mind is busier, where there's less of the profoundness and I'm like, oh. um, but it's really nice to be able to come back and to even get that glimpse and come back and get that glimpse and come back. So thank you. Yes. Yeah, I just want to build on that point of aimlessness. Um, so uh, I, as, as you know, but as most people don't, I, I, I haven't meditated in probably two years in any way like this and I live like half a block from here. Uh, and I've known, I, I know, I, I feel that there's this opportunity for a sense of stillness. Mm. I also know that in my life, I rarely feel it. Yeah, And it's this kind of... Um, I guess it's a sad feeling hmm. of knowing that there's something beautiful inside all of us and uh, and that I could access it, but there's something stopping me. I, yeah. I guess is is a is a resistance to being aimless, a hmm. sense of, of striving. Um, and to sit in practice mm. today, you know, I was apprehensive about it. And then of course I trust you, Eve. Mm. Um, and it was, it was really beautiful. And I had that feeling that you're describing of, of just this, um, almost euphoric sense mm. of presence and instead, and I, I did also drift in and out of it, but I also <laughs> with the, the third or fourth arrow, I suppose, where I, I also was forecasting I was, I would drift out of it and think, oh, well, tomorrow I'm just going to be uh, totally. busy again <laughs> that, that, for the rest of my life. Yeah. Uh, and it's this sense of, uh, I guess, a strange type of anxiety, a sense mm. that, wow, this is here. I'm in it now, but I, I, I have this sense that it's, it's hard to hold on to. Yeah. For me. Yeah. Beautifully described. Yeah. And that's, I think that's like the, I feel like you're on the razor's edge between kind of the yearning mm -hmm. and the striving, right? Mm -hmm. And the, the yearning, we talked about this last week of little like this, you know, the word is awkward for people, but devotion to your practice. And often we say devotion to a teacher and that gets very weird. But when you become devoted to your own awake nature, and that starts to kind of overpower everything else in the way and that yearning even though it's a sadness is like so sweet you know and it that's what will bring you the half block right the striving there's always a good excuse like striving is not a reliable friend like it might get us in the door but um yeah no but so relatable and i often as i'm practicing i'm like okay, well, but what about my practice tomorrow? Or like, what about, um, I have been on retreat many times planning my next retreat. <laughs> it's like, so it is, it's so insidious. And to be able to laugh about it, I think is really the key because, you know, it's kind of sweet, our mind and its insanity. But so is our wish to be free, you know, even sweeter. So thanks, Jamil. We're glad you're here. Yeah, Lucas. Hey. Um, yeah, it's good to be here. That was that was excellent. Um, 
I felt like I could, I often am pretty fidgety or fall asleep. And, um, I don't know. I, I think it's like the way I've been sitting post retreat, I think has been really helpful in the evening, kind of like figuring out how to, you know, keep my body still like my, my back postures. And I was able to follow for the most part, but like, you know, the people have been talking about, um, a lot of planning. I just, I just got off a of plane and my sense of time is all fucked up. Um, like I think I have a lot more time than I do, but it was really helpful. Um, you know, I would be planning, 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 and then, uh, catch, you know, some of your direction and then be able to kind of like realize how still I actually was, mm. um, because I, I wasn't moving. And, um, I, I guess I, I do did, you know, like, I think, um, comparing, you know, it's, an, an evening, um, you know, 25 minute meditation is going to be harder for me to, I think, get deeper and to open up. Hmm. I was able to kind of like feel still, but the, like the openness, I, I couldn't really get into that one. And yeah, maybe it's just because I had so much. Um, but yeah, if you have any suggestions on how to, I guess, like, um, yeah, like gently bring, bring, oneself back from like the the planning i i do so much i mean most people do but yeah it's really helpful yeah Thanks. yeah and i do think it's great you know coming back from a retreat and like really noticing like oh my god there is a difference in my practice like that's just really affirming and, and helpful to see like oh yeah like i can you know even um bring that back it's not just something that happens on retreat so that's great and then i think in the how to come back from the busyness of the mind i do find that really refocusing on the body and getting somewhere specific can be really helpful um, and so somewhere that's either totally, you know, banal and not exciting, sometimes that is helpful, like on the like elbows, but that can be a little too subtle. So, I mean, almost always, I don't know about you all, but I feel tension in my face a lot. You know, I can really, the deeper I practice, the more layers I notice of like tension holding in the face. And so just practicing by noticing the face wow, there's like a lot to work with and I'm no longer in my mind, but it's just enough to keep my mind kind of occupied, right? Or I also carry a lot of tension in my hands. So I'll just practice on my hands mm -hmm. uh, and then going back and trying to kind of, um, I often use this instruction that, that my teacher offers, which I love. It's again, it's all words and concepts, but leaning back in the mind, that really has an effect. Yeah, sounds like Daniel Fried. Yeah, right? It's sometimes these words, they hit us in the right way. So it's not as though we really are leaning back, but this idea that almost there's like a, you know, kind of foreground and a background. And it does feel like that sometimes, you know, I've, I've used that analogy before also of the thoughts as though they were coming out in front of the curtain on a theater stage and then going back. And we're, you know, we're really leaning back and leaning back. Um, and it is, you know, it didn't quite take us there, but then there's a point where there's no leaning back. There's no leaning forward. There's, you know, we really do try to break open into a space where, it doesn't feel like we're observing anymore. And though that seems like the most advanced practice, it's like really simple. You know, it's like really the simplest practice, but it can be hard because we are wanting to do something, wanting to see something. But I would just say like looking out within our practice to notice when we just achieve big fancy non-duality right because it's right there, right there. Like when we are completely at ease, spacious and open, and we're not a person thinking about what's happening, like probably in that profound moment, there isn't a separation of our mind, our heart, our body. Um, and so even kind of knowing that that's a possibility can be inspiring and something to look out for. Um, sometimes also in the morning for me, because I like to practice in the morning, but my mind really is very busy. I write down my entire to-do list or I journal for five minutes so then I can sit. That's another 
possibility. And we've talked about here also right after exercise. Um, so not like a three hour surf, but like an hour, right. And you then sit because the body is like at ease. The mind is at ease. It's easier. Yeah. Great question. Thanks. Yeah. All right. You ready to get three gates of liberation? Very exciting. Um, yeah, really, really beautiful. Uh, the three wondrous gates. Here we go. So yeah, I think I saw Claudia there online. So we're on 60. She's always wondering what chapter we we're on. 68. Yes. Good. Yeah. <laughs> and um there's a little bit, I'll just do like a tiny bit of the, you know, one of the things I often say that I love about this text of kind of the bio biographical life of the Buddha is we see that, you know, he faced many challenges even after he woke up. It's like, a, this is a bad analogy, but, you know, in the... Um, like us weekly or like people magazine it's like celebrities just like us you know and it's like they go grocery shopping they pick up their kids from daycare and it's kind of like buddha wow he has all these issues too and um <laughs> i find it like very sad in a way like even this enlightened being in like the best conditions possible where he has all of these retreat centers now all over india and so many followers and he's an enlightened being like people just sit in front of him and they attain enlightenment like it's amazing um and still there's infighting and so this will come up more um in the end of the buddha's life which we're getting very close to but um some of his closest students start kind of you know essentially um plotting against him. Um, they're jealous, they're competitive, they want to make their own sanghas. And so part of the beginning of this chapter is just um, that some of his like people are finding out that some of his students are sowing the seeds of confusion and trying to create their own sanghas outside of the Buddha Sangha. And yeah, just kind of... Um, yeah, I don't know exactly like where to land on all that. Like, I'm so glad that Thich Nhat Hanh decided to include all of these. And, you know, the way he compiles this is there's many various stories about kind of these betrayals of the students of the Buddha, and he just puts them all together. So um, you can know, and, you know, he lists all the historical sources. So as much as is possible to believe, just recognizing it is like really hard to live in community and harmony. And I don't know if anyone here has ever worked for an organization where you're like, really? In this organization, we're going to have these kind of problems? But you're like, yeah, even in centers of compassion and kind of like, right? Like, it's everywhere, right? And just, it's really hard because of, you know, our grasping, our striving, um, even in the best of conditions. So um, in this teaching, it's the Sutra on the Dharma seal. <clears throat> and he says, there is a wonderful teaching I'll speak to you about today. Please empty your minds of all other thoughts in order to calmly and peacefully hear, receive, and understand this. I really like that invitation, right? Like empty your mind of all other thoughts, make yourself available. And he says, Dharma seals are the signs of true Dharma much as we remember he uses the word dharma both for teaching and dharma essentially is like all phenomena all experience there are three seals which every teaching of mine bears emptiness signlessness and aimlessness these three characteristics are the three gates that lead to emancipation these dharma seals are known also as the three gates of liberation the first seal is emptiness Emptiness doesn't mean non-existence. It means that nothing exists independently. Emptiness means empty of a separate self. As you know, the belief in being and the belief in non-being, both incorrect. Everything depends on each other for its existence. This is because that is, and this is not because that is not. Thus, the nature of emptiness is interdependence. And I feel like we've spent 
at least three months on emptiness here. So um, I won't go into it too deeply, but again, such a misunderstood term. And yet so much wisdom and insight can come in that true seeing and knowing of emptiness. And you know, one way of seeing and knowing it is just that, that description of seeing the leaf on the night of awakening and recognizing this leaf isn't just a separate item. The leaf is the dependent co-arising of all of these factors. And it's not a complex idea. It's just that we forget it over and over and over. So anything feels like really intense, really, you know, about us and we get really caught up. So the op opposite of a view on emptiness is holding a grudge against someone, right? That is the opposite of feeling free in one's mind. <laughs> Resentment, grudges, like, and you know, it's hard. Sometimes our grudges aren't even ours. Like we inherit them from our family or from our country or from whomever. And it's so deep and it feels so fixed. And there's like not even an ounce of freedom in that view. It's just like, that's bad, they're bad, right? So it's, it's emptiness is a very simple context or concept, but a very difficult one to really hold in mind. And I love it as the simple definition here of it's the nature of interdependence. Okay, so everything is connected to everything, which can be a bit dizzying, but as you know, I, I love this concept in Buddhism that because the nature of everything being interdependent and everything having been connected for all time, everybody in this room was your mother in another lifetime. Like that level of connection, commitment, and care for one another is what kind of emptiness and interdependence asks of us. So it's probably going to be brought up like at least three more times before we finish the book, but any remaining questions or inquiries or how is the view of emptiness as we've been really reviewing it, living in you? Any, any thoughts on that? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, I just, um, I realize it. I've been realizing that if you're empty, you know something is empty. You're able to be filled with something. Mm. So in this case, you know, I try to be empty when we when we when we meet, so that when we're listening to or hearing the Dharma, we're allowed to say take something away. Yeah. Because uh, most of the time, we're we have something, or we're overflowing with with stuff mm. or thoughts that you know we're, we're, we can't be empty. So we we don't have the opportunity to to take new things in yeah beautiful thank you would you mind handing it back behind you there yes okay. um i guess so today i learned henry kissinger died mm -hmm. and i felt joy and I definitely have a grudge against that man yeah if you want to use such a small word <laughs> so how do you apply that. Yeah, <laughs> great. That's a great question. Yeah. And so I think, um, you know, it's really interesting. Actually, Wangil Rinpoche, um, one thing that he mentioned, he, he has a center or a couple centers for dark retreat. I don't know if folks are familiar, but dark retreat is a completely, well, like it sounds, dark retreat. And there's no light, no sound. You know, you are completely hermetically sealed in. They have this very complex way of getting food. And it's just traditional in Tibet to do that for 49 days. And in that 49 days, like you lose total sense of 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 everything right it's um that sensory deprivation and you are experiencing your mind so much greater like you know like on retreat everything becomes like more vibrant right because it's already but this is next level and he says that on the dark retreat like you really start to understand emptiness because you realize like your thoughts are like they're not real because there's nothing that's actually happening. Your thoughts are coming and coming and you're, they seem real, but actually there's no form to them. And that from that real understanding, compassion arises naturally without having to generate it. And so I think, you know, the, 
the emptiness of of Kissinger is like mm-hmm. he is not just a being, like he's a being of parents. And the parents had parents, and he's a product of his time and all of his wounding and all of his hurt and all of his, and not to let him off the hook for the harms, but really to see that this idea of this one fixed person, and and I don't know, I mean, I, I don't follow him that well, but it's possible in the last 10 years, he became a bodhisattva, right? And so like the view of emptiness is also kind of that view of equanimity of recognizing at any time. Whatever we think is true has so many more layers than we could possibly know of. So many, like maybe it was an amazing dad, right? Like granddad, like we we don't know. And it's not just that like everybody's good. It's more that this idea of a fixed person and the grudge we're holding is like this person in time. And it doesn't take into account that God, we're changing and shifting all the time. But um, yeah, it's a great, a great question. Yeah. And I do think, you know, emptiness and compassion, they're really intertwined. And I love that idea that, that, that Rinpoche shared of just that the compassion will naturally a lot arise when the wisdom or emptiness is really felt. Because it's, you know, when you're really practicing the Dharma, it's actually hard to hold a grudge, which is good because that truly Holding a grudge is living in hell. That's why I start at the end of his play, Hell is Other People. I got to see that play performed, and it's, like, amazing, right? This, All these characters show up on stage, and they're all, like, bewildered, like, why are you here? Why? Are you, who are you? And then none of them realize that they're all dead and that actually they're in hell, and hell is just being with these people who are annoying around you all the time <laughs> and not wanting it and being like, oh, God, oh, this is hell, you know? And, like, you could be enlightened in that moment if you accepted everybody around you, right? And so, yeah, it's interesting. Thanks. Any other questions, comments, emptiness? It's great because, again, this is such a... I'd say very confusing term, or it can be. Please, yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, uh, so I, I, I think that it's a, um, so containers and, and containers and building mutual trust and building community around this space and, and wherever we are to obtain that ability to, you know, break down the boundary and sort of go into emptiness. Mm. Um, I mean, it's, is is tricky. Uh, and, you know, Kissinger, for example, is, you know, Machiavellian philosophy and, and, and sort of, you know, structure around that entirely different establishment mm. and, and, when you introduce something like that into, you know, something that isn't that, that is, you know, Dharma opening, emptiness, gratitude, uh, compassion, you know, it's, it, 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 it doesn't, it, how does it fit? Like, yeah. how do you fit together and how do you, how do we fit, um, among, among that. Yeah. And, you know, for me, that's where, uh, it's, you know, real struggle. It's a real, real struggle. Um, and I feel like the emptiness and the silence and the spaciousness and the openness, I mean, they're luxuries (laughs) and, and, you know, when I look at it and I see these luxuries that I actually am trying to obtain mm. for myself, it makes me feel good when I can actually feel them mm. and luxurious and how lucky that is. But, mm. I mean, it's also just such a struggle to uh, uh, um, to fall into it. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think I think I know the question. I think I have three, three responses to it, maybe, and we'll see if I got it. Um, one I think is on the, you know, if we're all engaging in this, um, cosmic kumbaya of caring about each other, right. That's what one of my managers at work called it. <laughs> I was like, I love that. Um, he's like, oh, that's a little too cosmic kumbaya. It's like writing meditation scripts. And I was like, wow. Okay. Good to know. And, um, you know, Chogyam Trumpa talked about not practicing doormat compassion. Mm-hmm. So we don't lay ourselves out to be trampled on, 
Mm-hmm. And, you know, compassion doesn't mean we're soft and, and cozy all the time. We are that when that's what's being called for. But compassion really is like it's clear seeing and caring. But that could also look like fierce warriorship, right? So I think that's one way of like, we don't we don't have to like become, you know, the mar- soft marshmallow. We can still have like that really strong, clear seeing. And um, I definitely think practicing the Dharma is a luxury when our survival needs aren't met, like for sure. And in some ways, you know, we have to and have responsibility to practice for the others who can't. Right. And I don't think that these are luxuries. I actually think they are like basic sanity. And without it, we're just part of the problem. You know, there's no luxury of like being available, attuned and kind of connected to others. Like that is actually what is needed to save our planet. It's required. So I don't think, I mean, it feels good, which is a nice benefit, um, but it really is not, I don't think it's optional. So yeah, it's, yeah I, I, I see that. Yeah. And, and, you know, when you're waking up and you've got, you know, the kids and you've got the job and you've got this and the, that right. and the, this and the, that, and then, you know, you don't have an ability to actually, you know, and and so yeah. that's part of yeah it being a love you know i mean i agree with that yeah. it's a, a basic need yeah but it's oftentimes something which you know it's just hard to find yeah. yeah and again i really take from my teachers like alan wallace and and you know even the contemplative scientist richie davidson is saying everybody brushes their teeth twice a day like we can do that mental hygiene, right? Even at the beginning and the end of our day. And then so much of our practice isn't sitting quietly, which is great. It's the philosophical worldview that we bring, that deep non-harming. And so all of our life can be alchemical fuel for the fire. It's it's harder, you know, to do, but as, you know, saying over the weekend here, like, or maybe last week, I, don't know, I taught so much last week, it blended together a little, but just that sense of we all are householders, right? We're not monastics living removed from the world. But being a householder is a great way to wake up. We have so much material. It's all around us. So no, I love your question because it's such a common one. But I think to feel that confidence that we really can practice anywhere and everywhere, it is kind of that how we're bringing our intention into everything we do. It's, it's not easy. Um, I'm going to move us on to signlessness because I think it's confusing and <laughs> I actually think it's simple and it's not that different than emptiness. It is the word you're saying? Signlessness. S-I-G then? Without a sign. Yeah. And so the second seal, signlessness, means to transcend the confines of perception and mental discrimination. When people are unable to see the interdependent and empty nature of all dharmas, they perceive everything as being separate and independent. This exists apart from that. This is independent of all others. So looking at things in such a way is like taking a sword of mental discrimination and cutting up reality into small pieces. Mm -hmm. One is prevented from seeing the true face of reality. All Everything depends on everything else. This is in that. That fits within this. Um, contemplate in this way, and you'll see that ordinary perception is full of error. The eyes of perception are unable to see clearly and accurately as the eyes of understanding. And, you know, I, I love this. It's very well backed up by science, right? We are not seeing reality as it is. We are seeing reality through our perception, through our stories, our biases, right? We're not meeting reality as it is. And the signlessness is really recognizing I am not seeing interdependence and emptiness. And to be able to notice that, right? So Henry Kissinger dies. I'm happy. Hmm. What am I not seeing? Like, what am I not recognizing? You know, I should, not should, but if I do believe that there is a Buddha nature, basic goodness in every being, like maybe, maybe I wouldn't feel happy about this person. Maybe relief could be reasonable, right? But um, so that signlessness, 
transcending the confines of perception. And I really, I mean, I love this line, this idea that um, looking at the world in this way is like taking a sword to of mental discrimination and cutting up reality into small pieces, which is what we do, right? These people are good. Those people I don't know, so they're probably not very good. Those people I definitely don't like, right? So like just not seeing clearly. Um, and then, yeah, I'd love us to hang out a little longer in the, in the sign, in the, sorry, in the aimlessness, but just one more, um, line here. The eyes of perception are unable to see as clearly and accurately as the eyes of understanding. The eyes of perception can mistake a rope for a snake. With the illuminating eyes of understanding, the true form of the rope reveals itself and the image of the snake disappears. So just this idea of um, such like a classic example of how our perception can create an unreality. So what are the ropes in our life that we are seeing as snakes, right? This person doesn't like me. Oh my God, am I going to lose my job? Our planet's going to hell. I mean, not that those are inaccurate maybe, but that we, you know, are constantly seeing um, and miss seeing things. And so we end up being, again, imprisoned, the opposite of being liberated by these ideas and concepts which aren't even real. Um, so just being able to kind of really integrate this knowing, I'm not seeing things clearly. Like, I'm probably not seeing things clearly. Because it's interesting, he says, you know, what do we do with this is that we meditate deeply on this knowing it's very it's very like challenging in a way to just meditate on that i do think again applying it is what's going to be helpful like really seeing the ways that we get caught up in perception and projection the kind of negative rumination uh, of our our day our day-to-day -day thinking um, but it, it does get tricky here i think i think a lot of these slogans or i think of them as slogans they're very provocative. They want us to think about it. It doesn't truly mean that we don't have any perception and we completely try to just exist without any perception because um, we are constantly filtering information throughout our day-to-day -day experience, but to really kind of provoke us in that. So then I think we're going to get through aimlessness here. Aimlessness, I, I just really love this one not chasing after anything. And why? Because usually we try to avoid one thing by chasing after another thing. People pursue wealth in order to avoid poverty. The spiritual seeker rejects one thing in order to attain another thing. But if everything is contained within everything else, if everything is, how can you run away from one thing to pursue a different one? Within birth and death lies nirvana. Within nirvana lies birth and death. Nirvana and birth and death are not two separate realities. If you reject birth and death in order to pursue nirvana, you have not grasped the interdependent nature of all things. You have not yet grasped the empty and formless nature of everything. Contemplate aimlessness in order to end once and for all your chasing and running away. And then it's the quote, liberation and enlightenment do not exist outside of yourself. You only need to open your eyes to see that you yourself are the very essence of liberation and enlightenment. And I was um, reading another, there's like another monk who is in Thich Nhat Hanh's tradition talk, talking about aimlessness. And he said, it's such good medicine for our times because it really invites us to consider this possibility that you absolutely are already what you're looking for. Oh, I just love that. Like, stop going, like, stop running away, right? Already right here. And that aimlessness is a way of kind of cutting through this constant pursuing and seeking elsewhere. So, yeah, it's a very, very sweet term. I would never use that word naturally i'm gonna go practice aimlessness <laughs> on, on my path but it has kind of a um yeah it does it feels like that really like cutting cutting through that real specific terminology instead of just 
oh yeah, be more open and restful. It's like, just practice really having nowhere to go and nothing to do. And that means within your practice too, as I was saying earlier, it can be so hard to find that we bring our striving that we have in the natural and everyday environments right into the middle of our practice where we're trying to recover from those tendencies and habits and to kind of get onto ourselves about it. Like sometimes for myself, I have to not set a timer, right? Just like practice, not set an objective or a goal. And I do think the practice of just doing nothing with full commitment, it's kind of a classic practice instruction, do nothing with full commitment. Mm -hmm. Really beautiful, really good aimlessness practice that you're not just doing nothing and like falling into lethargy, but you're fully committed to doing nothing. So that's, um, that's your homework mm -hmm. for next week. And um, yeah, let's dedicate the merit here together. So really, <clears throat> once again, bringing our attention and awareness inward. And connecting with the body. Again, just noticing the sensations of the body. Mm -hmm. Noticing the face and the chest and the belly. Touching in and noticing that glimmering of basic goodness that's always already here. And bringing to mind and really considering the countless beings in this world who really need awakening and support. And countless beings who are suffering, struggling. And then bringing them to mind and making them real, we can really invite our hearts quivering, our hearts compassion. And so if it feels comfortable bringing together the hands in prayer in front of the heart, a symbolic offering. And in this intention of liberating all beings, we consider the possibility that any benefit we've generated here tonight in body and heart and mind could contribute to the possibility that all beings could know peace and ease. All beings could be healthy and strong. All beings could know happiness and its causes. And that all beings could be completely and totally free. Thanks, everyone. Great to see you. Um, please support the Dharma Collective. We pay rent in San Francisco. 